Okay, folks, uh, we will get started. So welcome to Cantini. It's a great delight to see this uh, wonderful crowd here, and we uh, are looking forward to a terrific uh, program. Uh, my name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum that sponsors this program. You're at Cantini Park. I know all of you know that. I practically know you all by name. But nevertheless, okay, Cantini Park is the historic estate of the late Colonel Robert R. McCormick. Uh, he was uh, a, a famous and wealthy guy, ran the Tribune for over 40 years, uh, lived here at Cantini Park. And among his many, many, many accomplishments, there is none of which he was prouder than his service as a citizen soldier in World War I. And we are named for the tiny little village north of Paris where America fought its first battle for freedom in Europe, and we are still in Europe. Uh, and that was at Cantini, France, in May of 1918, and the colonel was there. Like so many veterans, he was profoundly affected by his experience. He came home, he renamed this estate Cantini, and he honored soldiers and veterans in the memory of the people with whom he served for the rest of his life. Uh, he didn't have kids, and so he left his very considerable wealth uh, to found our parent organization, the Robert R. McCormick Foundation in Chicago, a major philanthropy, and he said, uh, uh, leave Cantini as a park for the people of Illinois. If you've joined us from Wisconsin or Indiana, that's fine. You're just as welcome. <laughs> we welcome you to any of the other states or wherever you're from. You're, you're very, very, very welcome here, and I'm sure the Colonel um, uh, would agree with that. But one of the things he wanted was a museum to his beloved First Division. And that's why there's a First Division museum here. And, and it's to our, to, for those of us who work in the museum, uh, that division, it's called the First Division because it was our First Division. We had no such animal before World War I. And we created one and 42 more and sent them to France. And the First Division was the very first one. And that division has been on active duty every single day since. And in a couple months, uh, we'll celebrate a century of service. Not a single day has gone by that we have not been served by the men and women of the Big Red One. And today, just let me put this little plug in. You can fly around the world to every national security challenge we are experiencing. We have troops at Fort Riley, Kansas that will likely be deployed into Eastern Europe within the year from the 1st Infantry Division. And the headquarters of the 1st Infantry Division is in Iraq. And they are helping the Iraqis fight ISIS. They are in charge of the American effort to advise and assist the Iraqi security forces that are right now fighting for Mosul. The 1st Brigade of the 1st Infantry Division is in South Korea where it's bolstering our deterrent against that nutcase and his missiles. Uh, and the Aviation Brigade is in Afghanistan helping the U.S. Special Forces and the Afghan Security Forces conduct air assault, combat air assault operations almost every day against the Taliban, ISIS, and the remnants of Al-Qaeda. And so the 1st Infantry Division, just as it was in World War II, just as it was in World War I, is around the world serving all of us. And so please keep them, uh, those wonderful soldiers and their families, uh, in your thoughts and prayers. Okay, so from that distinguished 100-year history, okay, uh, it, uh, the 1st Division certainly played a very prominent role in World War II. And one of the things that excites me about the history of the 1st Division is its very frequent intersections with the culture of the United States and who we are as a people and our history. And, and it, it's just, just fascinating that we get to tell 100 years of American history through the perspective and stories of the 1st Infantry Division. So one of the many, many, many soldiers who served in the 1st Division in World War II was this guy named Sam Fuller, okay, about whom tonight's speaker is going to talk. And after the war, he became a very prominent filmmaker. Uh, and... Uh, and never forgot the experiences that he had as a soldier in the 1st Infantry Division in World War II. And so that experience profoundly influenced his art uh, for the rest of his life. He passed away in 1997 and produced, directed, uh, wrote scripts for uh, dozens of uh, movies and television productions. And I'm stealing our, 
our speakers uh, thunder a little bit, but that's the story. We're not going to tell a story so much about World War II tonight as the effect of World War II on a person who played a very important role in the cultural history of the United States in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and into the 1980s. Uh, that guy is Sam Fuller, and you can see him there wearing his big red one patch and uh, chomping his cigar. So, without further ado, uh, our speaker tonight is Marsha Gordon. And Marsha uh, is um, uh, a professor of film at North Carolina State University. And I have to look at several things here to keep it all straight. She has a PhD from the University of Maryland. Uh, she is the author previously of Hollywood Ambitions, Celebrity in the Movie Age, and co-editor of Learning with Lights Off, Educational Film in the United States. This is her third book, uh, Film is Like a Battleground, Sam Fuller's War Movies, and oh, by the way, this book is for sale in the gift shop, and so when we're done here, if you want to go down there and be one of the first to have one, as I have done, this is mine, don't pick it up. Uh, and afterwards, uh, Marsha will be uh, signing these. Um, she, uh, ha she has a very, very rich academic uh, pedigree. She has given talks all over the world, Vienna, Prague, London, many, many places, National Gallery of Art, National Archives, Czech National Film Archive, North Carolina Museum of Art. Uh, she's a speaker. She's leaving here and speaking at the University of Chicago and then at Michigan State before she goes back to North Carolina. She has taught graduate and undergraduate courses on war documentaries, the history of educational film, American War Movies, 1950s American Film, the musical, studio era Hollywood, cinema stylist, Nicholas Ray, Douglas Kirk, Sam Fuller, women in film, history of film to 1940, film and literature, Warner Brothers, African American film, an introduction to film and international crime film. She's not a military historian. She is a historian and professor of the art of filmmaking who became fascinated with a very important veteran of the 1st Infantry Division. And it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marsha Gordon. Well, now you must have high expectations <laughs> after that glowing introduction. Um, I really want to thank Paul and JD for all of the arrangements that went into my coming here this evening. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have seen The Big Red One, Fuller's 1980 film with Lee Marvin and Mark Hamill? Okay, about half of you, maybe a little bit more than half of you. This is probably the film, if you know Fuller, that you probably know. It's his best known film um, for a number of reasons. And I'm not really going to be talking about that film tonight. I am going to do a little bit of an illustrated talk with some images, archival stuff, and show you some clips from at least one of Fuller's films. And, and I thought it would be interesting to focus on some of the aspects that I talk about in the book and that are also in his films that are directly related to military and government history. And a little bit about the process of archival discovery and research that I did um, in order to bring me to where I am with this book, which is, um, as Paul pointed out, I'm not a military historian, but I really had to delve into military history to understand Fuller. Um, World War II was the defining aspect of Fuller's life. It was the experience that he wrote about, thought about, dreamed about, had nightmares about, um, made films about for his entire career. It informed absolutely who he was as a person. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Fuller, but very quickly, um, there's an excellent uh, posthumously published autobiography called A Third Face that um, uh, was published obviously after Fuller passed away. And if we could bring that quote up, if you hit the PowerPoint forward. Um, this quote from uh, A Third Face, people who have never lived through it will never, never know what war's unfeelingness feels like, never know the cold taste of metal in your mouth just before the violence begins, the wet toes, the churning in your stomach that seems like it's going to burn a hole in your belly, the dull drumming in your brain, the ghoulish visions come to life, hell, words just can't describe it. This is from that autobiography. And I really love this particular way that this is articulated because to me, he spent his whole career trying to describe it with words and with moving images. This is something he wanted to convey 
to audiences, to people who had fought, to people who had never fought, um, was to try to get people to understand uh, the importance and consequences of war for the foot soldier in particular. Um, I also want to point out Samantha Fuller, his daughter, has recently done a documentary called A Fuller Life, which is wonderful. You can stream it online, and it's, um, it really captures the arc of his career if you become interested in him tonight. A um, couple quick things about Fuller. He was raised in New York. He became a journalist first, um, so he was really schooled in kind of the trenches of journalism in New York City. He started writing novels and screenwriting um, before he fought in World War II. And so the war, um, after the war, he began his filmmaking career, but before it, he had some experience writing. So he was um, in the Big Red One. He was shipped to North Africa with K Company, the 26th Infantry, and ended the war um, with I Company 16th Regiment. Um, um, he fought and documented as um, uh, in, a, in the capacity of uh, writing about uh, what was going on for, for reports and also for documenting the 16th Infantry, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, in the Ardennes, Central Europe, Normandy, Northern France, Rhineland, Sicily, and Tunisia. Um, he earned a Bronze Star, Good Conduct Medal, Silver Star, and the European, African, Middle Eastern Service Medal uh, with Bronze. Arrowhead. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So when I was researching this book, if we could take the lights down just a tiny bit so we can see the images a little more, that would be great. Um, so Krista Fuller, his widow, and Samantha, his daughter, have an incredible collection of uh, Fuller's personal papers, letters, etc. So I spent a lot of time that image is really hard to see. Um, I apologize for that. Um, in their personal collection, looking at all of the documentation about his time in the war. This includes any kind of um, official documentation, but he also kept journals. Um, he wrote letters to his family, especially to his mother and his brother back home in New York, that really detail a lot of what life was like for him as a soldier. Um, if you could go to the next one. I just realized I'm calling on you, but I've got this clicker. <laughs> You're probably like, God, I thought she was smart. <clears throat> Anyhow, so, um, so this is an example of some of the stuff that I got to look through. All of Fuller's photographs, which if they weren't notated on the front, he went back later and he would say where this was, who was in the image. Um, his letters to his brother and his mother. Um, so I really got to become familiar with his voice, um, not just as a writer, but as a soldier and as someone documenting his feelings and his experiences as they were happening. Um, I was also very, very fortunate in that I got to work with a bunch of his personal 16 millimeter films. Now, you weren't really supposed to do this. Those you all know this, um, but Fuller's mom sent him a 16 millimeter camera, a uh, Bell and Howell camera when he was overseas and he shot a lot of footage during the war. Um, and the most important of that footage I write about extensively in the book, and it's a film that he later titled um, VE Plus One, May 9th, 1945. And this is the documentation after the liberation of Falkenau concentration camp um, in Czechoslovakia. And so what happens is, is he films this ritual that was happening all over Europe, but this is on a much smaller scale because it was a smaller camp. And this is the neighboring towns people are brought in and they are forced to deal with the dead, diseased bodies of the people in the camp and to give them, to clothe them and to give them a proper burial and to bring them through the town because everyone in the town said they had no idea what was happening inside the camp. And so Fuller filmed that. And it's an amazing document and I understand that it may be part of the museum opening um, when the museum opens, which is phenomenal. Um, I nominated this film two years in a row to the Library of Congress National Film Registry and it was named in December 2014. So it's um, become a part of our nation uh, moving image history now. Um, so this is something that I had the pleasure of working with. It's difficult material, but it is so important. Um, I also spent a good amount of time at the National Archives, both in College Park and Washington, D.C. As a film historian, that is not normal territory. This was a whole new world. Um, for film historians, I think it's a treasure trove. The 16th Infantry Journal reports are totally fascinating, and you can see here, I don't know if you can read that from where you are, but this is documenting some of what's happening at Falkenau at the end of the war when, um, when uh, they are being asked to come and deal with this town and the people who are survivors and also the dead. Um, 
you can see, I'll, I'll be in this town tomorrow where that blue arrow is. Uh, and he wants all the males from the town to come and be part of this ritual. Um, so I, I worked with this, this material. Um, also, Fuller himself was involved in, take this off of here. Oh, that makes me so much happier. Um, so Fuller was also, this is, I discovered this book fairly late into my research, Corporal Sammy Fuller. This came out in 1946. So part of what Fuller was doing during the war when he got reassigned to do documentation, got pulled off his gun for a while, um, was to uh, document, to start trying to tell the history um, of the 16th Infantry so that this book could come out after the war. And so this is an incredible account because once you know Fuller's voice, you can read this book and tell the parts that Fuller wrote because he had such a distinctive voice. So after the war, oops, another thing, um, Fuller published during the war. This story, Johnny Had a Little Lamb, um, came out, um, and this is a reprint that was in Blue Book magazine. This is the most heartbreaking story about this guy whose job is to clear minefields before the rest of his group comes through, and he uses this uh, flock, and he gets really attached to this baby lamb, and it is I mean, you have no heart if you do not cry in this story. It is a heartbreaker of a story, but this is Fuller, again, during the war, starting to try to figure out how you begin to articulate your experiences of the war. So after the war, uh, this is an abbreviated filmography. So um, he comes back, he makes his way back to Hollywood um, in late 1945, and his first film is 1949. His first war film is 1951, and that's the film I'm gonna spend a little more time talking about um, tonight, The Steel Helmet. Do you all know this film, The Steel Helmet? Okay, some yeses, some noes, good. Um, this is the very first time Fuller got writer, producer, uh, director credit, um, and Fuller was one of the first directors to make a Korean war film. Um, and he basically sped through production. By the way, that image is uh, uh, up there. You see the, the first infantry. Uh, the first division, sorry, um, uh, insignia, thank you. <laughs> What's wrong with me tonight? Um, this is uh, from a Western that Fuller made, so he always inserted uh, that symbol into his films. So these are images from the steel helmet, which I'm gonna spend some time talking about now. Um, and he was one of the first directors to make a Korean War film. He basically sped through production on this to get it in theaters in time to capitalize on what was going on in Korea. Um, the film previewed in late 1950, and it was released February 2nd, 1951, which was barely six months after America had sent troops overseas, but also at a time of pretty discouraging news from the front uh, in the form of a major Chinese-backed offensive that had just forced a retreat of UN forces south of the 38th parallel, resulting in the retaking of Seoul by communist forces. Uh, Fuller shot this film in less than two weeks. That is no time, okay? That's no time then. It's really no time now. Um, it was under $200,000, which is a microscopic budget. There are no stars in this film. If you go, well, wait a second, isn't that Gene Evans? Yeah, that's Gene Evans before he was a star, okay? So Fuller gives him his first crack at a big role as well. Um, Fuller shoots in Griffith Park in Los Angeles. That is Korea, okay? So this is a down and dirty, I'm getting this out, ripped from the headlines kind of story, and that's the kind of story Fuller wanted to tell. So the main character in this film, Sergeant Zack, who's played by Gene Evans, um, it's really an ensemble film, um, even though Zach is the main character in some ways. Um, but unlike the World War II films that came before it, Fuller's film presents this kind of unheroic, uncharismatic protagonist who's aligned with a barely cohesive group. So this is not the big hero leading a group together who are, you know, really fighting for uh, a kind of clear cause. Um, as a matter of fact, these men really don't seem to have much in the way of an objective, except that they have to keep kind of fighting the enemy when they encounter it. And so Sergeant Zack does not come off as this team player for a patriotic cause. Um, he's in, not engaged in the kind of necessary struggle that the way that he was on D-Day in the earlier war. And so Fuller often uh, created these retread characters who fought in World War II and then came back um, 
in Korea in this context. Um, instead, he's an individualist, and he's the sole survivor um, of his unit who ties his lot to another group of soldiers for mostly selfish reasons. Um, Zach does not offer poetry about the war. He wants to live through the war, and his deepest connection in the film is to a signature character type um, in the Fuller world, which is a young orphan, um, in this case a South Korean whom Zach nicknames Short Round. And if you guys are familiar with Steven Spielberg and Indiana Jones, that character Short Round is named for this um, much beloved character in the steel helmet. Fuller um, is greatly admired by Spielberg. So the rest of this group is so interesting. So it's um, another World War II veteran, newly escaped from North Korean capture, African-American medic, uh, Corporal Thompson, played by James Edwards. You see him here in the bottom right of the frame with a prisoner of war. Um, you'll be seeing a scene from that in a minute. And then basically, the remnants of this American patrol, most importantly, Lieutenant Driscoll, who's this inexperienced, ineffectual leader, who eventually convinces Sergeant Zach to help the group on their mission. Um, there's also a very capable World War II veteran and Japanese-American Sergeant Tanaka played by Richard Liu. And um, you can see the, the cast on, uh, on the set there. Sam Fuller is the one with the cigar standing up with the, with the white suit on. And um, this is a very racially diverse cast for 1951 and very deliberately so. And it's one of the things that actually gets Fuller in trouble uh, with this film. So um, in the steel helmet, Fuller is not interested in just exploring the nuances of the conflict. As a matter of fact, there's no discussion of why we fight um, in the context of Korea or America's decision to become involved in it. Instead, he presents his audiences with what he cared about most of all, and that is the difficult, confusing, and exhausting experience of being a foot soldier. And that is what Fuller was really committed to. So as the press book for the film put it, you may not like it, but it's war. It's honest and violent and gutty. There is no glamour, okay? So let's just look at that first clip um, to give you a sense of what Fuller is up to in this film. And I'm sure you all know World War II films well enough to immediately see why this is different. I found a dead American. You sure he's dead? You gotta be sure you know. Half his head is gone. I better check. Shut his head was gone, save his strength. Did you examine him? No, sir. Smart. Did he get his dog tags? Dog tags? Are you kidding? But we ought to find out who he is. Look, Lieutenant. As long as their emotions get the best of you. Dead man's nothing but a corpse. Nobody cares who he is now. Get his dog tags. Yes, sir. Ever hear of a body being booby trapped? Get his dog tags. Big deal. Hey, uh, did he, uh, have his pack on him? He took it off for the break. Where is it? There. a short round. And take care of them. Don't break them. Okay, so that is the war-hardened uh, sergeant, right? And he does not have the kind of um, heroic team building qualities. He is about survival and he's also about experience. He can't stand the kind of naive, um, especially uh, uh, Lieutenant Driscoll in this film who uh, uh, Basically, Sergeant Zack is a survivor. He's not a hero, okay? So um, what is notable, I think, is that this film makes that a really admirable quality. 
Um, which I think you would be hard pressed to find in a World War II film. I don't know many in which that kind of character comes out ahead um, in the war. And so some critics, when this film came out, were very alarmed by that. Um, and partly the reason for that is that uh, the American government, the, the media, et cetera, were really scrutinizing films at the time for subversive content, right? There's all of this anxiety about communist infiltration. And so um, that aspect of this film combined with really frank discussions about home front racism um, against Japanese Americans and against African Americans. And then there's another incident in the film in which the prisoner of war is killed by Sergeant Zack. And it's I don't want to explain the full context just yet, but let me just say, obviously, if it had happened, it would have been a violation of the Geneva Conventions. But it's a movie, right, and not the real world. And so what happens is there's this big debate that uh, the government starts having you know, within uh, the Department of the Defense and the Department of the Army. Um, and then the media starts having about whether or not Fuller is putting this stuff in this film in order to somehow subvert the American government, which astonished Fuller, because Fuller thought, I'm a veteran, I'm a patriot, how dare you question um, my Americanness and my um, commitment to this country uh, just because I have a character who's not a perfect character. So the line between propaganda and, uh, and fiction gets blurred here. And I want to show the POW clip, if we can, before I talk about the behind the scenes with the Army and Department of Defense. So this is one of those conversations about race between the POW and one of the soldiers. Hey, Baldy, what are you doing down here? I asked you to stay up there till you got that fixed. Yes, sir. I was real smart, Major, smashing our communication. But Baldy's an expert. He'll have that radio working and nothing flat. You guys have a bad habit of starting something you can't finish. I don't understand you. You can't eat with them unless there's a war. Even then it's difficult. Isn't it so? That's right. You pay for a ticket, but you even have to sit in the back of a public bus. Isn't that so? That's right. A hundred years ago, I couldn't even ride a bus. At least now I can sit in the back. Maybe in 50 years, I'll sit in the middle. Someday even up front. There's some things you just can't rush, Buster. You're a stupid man. You're the stupid Joe. Why don't you get wise, Buster? Ruining my dressing. We can go ahead and stop it. There. Thank you. Okay, so this kind of conversation about home front racial tensions and discrimination was not typical, right, in 1951, and especially in the context of this kind of trench brotherhood where everyone is together and supporting each other, and um, there's this sense of kind of racial harmony within the group, and then talking about the realities of challenges on the home front. This is not usual at all. So this is where, to me, it gets really interesting when you peer behind the curtain. We can all see this film, right? But what was happening behind the scenes? So as with any combat-related film produced during war, Fuller worked directly with official channels in Washington, D.C. during the production of the Steel Helmet, which was required in order to get Department of Defense stock footage and also to get a stamp of official cooperation and approval, which, when granted, appeared prominently in a given film's opening or closing credits. I'm sure you've seen these all before, you know, with the participation of blah, blah, blah. Um, Fuller first wrote to Lieutenant Colonel Claire Town of the Office of Public of Information in an effort to secure combat footage, um, preferably sourced from Korea. He wrote, I was a rifleman with the 16th Infantry 1st Division from Africa to Czechoslovakia. And Fuller explained in his request, 
Um, it is a personal matter with me to make sure that this is the kind of an infantry story that the infantry itself could find no fault with. So, after reviewing the script, Lieutenant Colonel Town dictated, quote, letter to Mr. Fuller pointing out many features in the script which are considered objectionable, inaccurate, and not typical. As written, the story would not qualify for Army cooperation because the personnel and incidents are not considered to be in the best interests of the service. So in addition to tactical and technical issues with the script, which I won't go into detail, but basically this letter dismantles. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Town voiced objections to the portrayal of an incompetent and cowardly officer. That's Lieutenant Driscoll who gives the command uh, for the soldier to go get the dog tags. And an arrogant, despicable character, that's Sergeant Zack, Gene Evans, who actually, if you've watched the film before, people love Sergeant Zack, um, uh, despite the fact that he's gruff. Um, and Town and the other Department of Defense reviewers were also highly critical about several plot points, especially the killing of that prisoner of war, which they felt would do a great injustice, this is a quote, to the service and the many competent, intelligent, and responsible officers who are fighting and dying in Korea. Now, Fuller would most certainly have been devastated by this response because he did not feel like he was making a film that was undermining American forces, but was rally, rather trying to tell a good war story, okay, in which um, things did not always go as planned. Um, but he really entered into this consultation with the pride of, of, of being a veteran and wanting to tell an infantry story that he felt was honest to the experiences of being a veteran. Um, so although the government could withhold footage, withhold cooperation, an endorsement as they did on this occasion. Um, they had no ability to exert any direct control over this film or any film um, being made in this country. Um, what Fuller did was he said, look, I'm going to give it one more shot. I'm going to bring a rough cut of this film to Washington and I'm going to show it to people and I'm going to convince them that it's not what they think it is. And so he did. Um, and the Army decided, no, this is still not fit for cooperation. But they did authorize a small amount of footage as long as he did not give them credit in the film. Ouch, okay, so um, this is a clear stipulation of disassociation. Um, so in terms of the release print on this film, if you do watch this, you will notice the title card, and it says this story is dedicated to the United States Infantry, which I actually think was a kind of canny way to make it seem like there was more support than there was. So um, the Hollywood studios at this time were very reluctant to take on controversial subjects, and especially those that might seem sympathetic to any kind of communist viewpoints because of the investigations into Hollywood in the late 1940s by the House on American Activities Committee. Um, and interestingly enough, when this film came out, it drew the ire of both the right and the left. And so there's this incredible media kerfuffle that starts off, many of you heard of the Daily Worker, this was the communist newspaper at the time. And so in the pages of this communist newspaper, American communist newspaper, their columnist, David Platt, totally misreported Fuller's encounters with the War Department. and. Um, so you can see the title of this, War Department OK Slaying of Prisoner of War in Coming Film on Korea, OK? So he's stirring the pot with a lie, basically, um, uh, on the left. Um, so uh, with no context presented for this scene, and the reason Sergeant Zack kills that prisoner of war is because Short Round is killed, OK? So the orphan he has taken in um, and may or may not uh, have a desire to bring back with him to the United States is killed, and he is so heartbroken and angry about it that he kills the prisoner, okay? So nobody who saw the film and wrote about it in, in kind of mainstream media saw it as a Geneva Convention issue. They saw it as this soldier has a heart, even though he's hard on the outside, and I think that's how Fuller um, meant it. But um, this... Basically, you know, he calls this a monstrous film and he attacks, Fuller attacks the government. So largely in reaction to this, there's a conservative columnist named Victor Riesel um, who attacks the steel helmet for what he describes as anti-American sentiment embedded within uh, the film. Um, and so in this time period, columnists had a lot of power, right? Whether it's Hedda Hopper writing in Hollywood um, or Victor Riesel writing in syndicated columns. So, 
Victor Riesel's column, which is attacking Fuller, became the first piece of evidence in his FBI file. So the FBI goes, wait a second, who's this guy making films? Um, so J. Edgar Hoover's men take up an investigation of Fuller's politics on screen and off, and um, Hoover himself wrote a note that the steel helmet can do our soldiers little good on fighting fronts as it depicts a GI murdering North Korean prisoner of war and depicts a GI as weak and fumbling in argument with a communist, communist prisoner. And that's the scene you just saw. Um, which I guess he didn't think had strong enough arguments. So um, after first attacking the film for that prisoner of war killing scene, the Daily Worker's David Platt moved on to the racial aspects of the film, calling the film racist to its core and reflecting the brutal disregard for human life and human rights, especially where the victims are colored, which has made this the uh, war of the big money against a small nation struggling for its freedom, the most unpopular war in our history. I think, of, again, really misreading a lot of things going on here. Um, and he ends the article with actually, it's kind of a funny line, but no wonder it was found necessary to shoot the Korean prisoner to death. He was asking too many damned embarrassing questions about the war. Because there's another scene in which he's also asking um, the Japanese American prisoner why um, he uh, is fighting at all. Um, so David Platt uh, basically is, I think, completely misunderstanding Fuller as making simply a glorification of war picture, which I don't think Fuller was interested in um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, but uh, despite and perhaps because of all of this controversy, um, this film made a ton of money. Okay, it was made for next to nothing. Okay, two hundred thousand dollars, and in less than six months, it had already generated over a million dollars in revenue. Okay, so this is a big, it's a low budget film that makes a lot of money and it allows Fuller to write his own ticket. So what does Fuller do? Well, he makes another Korean War film. <laughs> so he hadn't gotten into enough trouble the first time. This one is with the backing of a major studio, by the way, Fixed Bayonets. Anyone seen Fixed Bayonets? Okay, less people. This is a really interesting film worth seeing, and it is just not seen all that often. So he decides to tell another story about Korea, um, and this is about an office school, officer school graduate, Corporal Denno, played by Richard Basehart. You can see him in the upper left there. Um, who's terrified about having to kill after a bad experience he had in, um, in boot camp. And there's three men ahead of him in command, Sergeant Lonergan, played by Michael O'Shea, Lieutenant Gibbs, played by Craig um, Hill, and then Sergeant Rock, played by Gene Evans. Uh, they're all killed in action over the course of the film, so he has to lead uh, his diminished platoon at film's end. As it turns out, He's great at it, okay? Everything, the mission is successful. This is a positive outcome. Um, uh, and I think, let's go ahead and look at the clip. Um, uh, let me see what I called that. Let's look at a clip from this. Let's look at, let's look at it in the Army, because this kind of is a scene that articulates some of his anxiety and his conversation with uh, Gene Evans. <laughs> They're holed up in this cave. Oh? Oh? Hey, Rock. Hmm? Whatever made you stay in the army? You woke me up just to ask me that. Well, I've been meaning to ask you, but I just never got the chance. Get some shut-eye before those people start hitting us again. You want a gab, huh? Yeah. That's something I've been trying to figure out myself for a long, long time. What makes a guy stay in the Army? I wish I knew the answer. Some of us, because we're dumb, I guess. Some are poor. Some are a little lazy. Some of us got some vanity. Know what I mean? Yeah. Some of us old pros stay in, even when we know that after the fighting's over, some of us will rust in peace and rot in hospitals. Even when we know all that, we stay in because... I don't know, it's hard to explain. 
Maybe it's something that just happens to you. Maybe it's the pension. I wish I knew the answer. I don't want to be a corporal. I want to get busted. You what? I always wanted a lead. When I was in officer school, I was the head of the class. They said I had the makings of a leader. The education, the brains, the knack of solving tactical situations. And one day we had a problem with live shells. We had a knockout a tank. There was a red flag there, warning not to send any men in that area. I was in command of the platoon. I don't know what happened, Rock. The minute that stuff started flying through the air and I had to deploy my squad, something happened right in the pit of my gut. I got panicky. I sent a squad to the danger zone. Four men were hit, one seriously. I was there when they amputated his leg. They gave me another chance. Again, I got into a sweat the minute I had to give orders. Then they found out what I'd known all the time. I can take an order. I can't give one. Hmm. Some men are afraid of high places. Some are afraid of water. And some are afraid to be responsible for the deaths of a lot of other guys. That's me, Rock. I don't want to carry that load. Yeah, well, a lot of guys sweat out leading an outfit. Ain't nobody looking for responsibility. Sometimes you find it whether you're looking for it or not. But I'm not looking for it. It takes brains to be a leader. I'm just smart enough not to want any part of it. Even a two-striper like you, you'll find out. It takes more than brains to be a corporal. You gotta have the guts to lead. Look, I'll do my job. It's just... I don't want to lead, that's all. You take it easy. I ain't promoting you. Lonergan and me, we'll be around for a long time. Ain't no burp gun fast enough to cut down an old doggy like me. If anything happened to you, Rock, I'd pull out. Look, don't suck around nobody in the army for apron strings. That's all you gotta depend on. You take care of her and she'll take care of you. You're over the hump. You're a rifleman. You're wrong, Rock. I didn't shoot that red. Jonesy did. Uh, well, there's a lot of reds out there. You'll get plenty of chances. Okay, so, like, you, you can't imagine John Wayne playing that role, right? Like, talking, I mean, these are not conversations that he would have had. And by the way... This, and as well as the steel helmet, so many of these anecdotes and stories, the body being booby-trapped in steel helmet, this conversation, they're in Fuller's World War II journals. So these were things that he observed happen or he heard stories about that he wrote down and said, use this in a later story. So these all, the genesis of all of this is actually in World War II, even though for practical purposes, like the market, he moved these to um, Korea. So... You know what happened with the steel helmet. Here we go again um, with Fox now, who's making this film, major studio. The first film, uh, Steel Helmet, was independently produced. Going to the Department of Defense, going to the Army, asking for permission. And something happened on this film that I believe never happened with any other film in Hollywood history. I don't say this in the book because I was not 100% sure, but I'm 98%, so I'm saying it out loud to you here, which is that there was a split decision, and the Department of the Army agreed to cooperate, and the Department of Defense said, no, we want nothing to do with this. And this created a huge behind-the-scenes fight between DOD and the Army. Um, right hand, left hand, um, not knowing what the other is doing, arguing about it, um, disagreeing about it, and coming down with dissenting opinions. And um, the consequence of that was, I think, it got r much harder after uh, fixed bayonets to get cooperation from the Army in particular because Department of Defense really stepped in. Um, what happened was is Department of Defense and the Army had different reviewers, so they asked people to look at the script, and the Department of the Army people thought it was great. One review said that this script, um, this was Captain Curtin of the Army, um, 
up, said that this script could be made into a highly realistic movie that will pay a much deserved tribute to the infantry. The basic action, which was rear guard, is plausible enough. The weak corporal rising up through the chain of command reminded me of a training film on combat leadership that was made during World War II. The dialogue is quite realistic, except I don't remember soldiers talking about dying so much. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, by and large, a good report. Um, the second report they got from the Army was chain of command, makes sense. Um, uh, many of these soldiers uh, you know, could have received uh, unit citation, or the, the, uh, the, the unit has, in my opinion, earned a distinguished unit citation and numerous individual awards and so on. So then the Department of Defense reviewer says this is complete communist craziness. So totally dissenting opinion. It serves the Communist Party line. It fulfills the function by presenting a limited, almost totally negative view of the Korean War, which leaves the audience with the feeling that fighting in Korea was and or is pointless and militarily, politically, and psychologically unnecessary. There is no audience feeling of elation at the end of the script, just one of relief. And Fuller not, didn't like to end his films with what he called the big parade, because he said the infantry is on the ground fighting, there's no parade until the end of the war. And so, um, okay, so this is crazy enough. So then I'm at the National Archives and I'm doing research, and I find out that the guy who wrote that, d that opinion for the Department of Defense, which made them not cooperate with Fuller's film, actually submitted to Fox a rewrite of the screenplay. So I think this guy was a frustrated screenwriter who was like looking for a way, I mean, this is crazy, right? So he gets this, he rewrites it, but the plot points are the same. It's still rear guard action. You still have bitter soldiers. You still have, I mean, it's, it's one of the strangest things that I encountered, the absurdity of this one person who obviously had an ax to grind or some kind of agenda basically undermining um, the Department of Defense uh, ability to cooperate with Fuller on this film. Now, they had been burned with the steel helmet, right? Because they did not realize that this whole kerfuffle was gonna happen with the media, so they were very, very anxious. And um, so, uh, again, this created this big kerfuffle between the Army and Department of Defense. And um, the greatest absurdity of all is that uh, when Fuller finally showed the print to both the Department of Defense and the Army, I mean, listen to who's at this screening. Let me see if I can find that very quickly. Um, maybe I didn't include that. So he, this is like every possible person that was working for DOD and the Army in any kind of media relations capacity. They all come to a screening after the film is made, the release print's done. They're like, yeah. That's not so bad. Um, and the Department of Defense basically says, maybe we were a little harder on that film than we needed to be. Um, so what's interesting to me about this from the perspective of being a Hollywood historian, and again, not a military historian, is that there's this really fallible process um, and very conflicted with which Hollywood and committed war filmmakers like Fuller had to deal on war film productions um, with interpretive opinions ranging so widely, even with regard to such a limited sampling as the steel helmet and fixed bayonets, and I can assure you this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the documentation. Um, what emerges is less a sense uh, that the governmental gatekeepers were successfully protecting American audiences from potentially subversive ideas, but rather that films are impossible to categorize and characterize with any consistency or certainty, um, even by people who were looking for basically the same information. Um, the government and the military certainly had to look out for their own interests, um, whether that was merely deflecting criticism against their oversight or attempting to minimize um, the potential damage created by an industry over which it had very limited control and that had a very, very far reach. Um, but considering each film as just a reflection of the real world, um, you know, I'm, I keep coming back to that moment where they say, look, this would have been a violation of the Geneva Conventions. And Fuller's answer would have been, this is a movie. You know, that there's a difference between a movie and real life. Um, uh, it is a reminder of the culture that existed in the 1950s and that Fuller was kind of pushing, I think, back against. So, 
Um, oh, I found the list. It was in my last paragraph. Don't worry, we're almost done. Um, the final document in the fixed bayonets file is the most absurd. It pertains to the final review of the release print of the film, which was seen, are you sitting down? By representatives of Victorial Branch, OPI, OSD, Town and Baruch, these are individuals, together with representatives of Army PID, Security Review, OPI, OSD, OSD Public Relations, Surgeon General's Office, Blood Program, OPI, OSD, WAC Director's Office, American Red Cross, and the studio. Okay, so this is, this is a big room. This is a movie theater's full. And, uh, and basically, they said, well, I, everything kind of got fixed during the making of it. Um, there might be a couple of technical weaknesses, but this film is no longer objectionable. This is the consensus. So um, the irony of this is that Fuller and Company made the recommended changes, and so all of this hand-wringing and permission withholding um, ended up being much ado about nothing. So um, again, I think the kind of wealth of information when you're pulling from all of these archival sources at places like the National Archives and Library of Congress can really help us understand some of what was going on in the movie representations of war in this time period. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, or hear your comments, and uh, thank you very much. Yes. Honestly, I, I looked at his uh, uh, his write up very, very carefully, and I saw so little. So one is he begins the film actually with um, a Philippine death march at the end of World War II that um, that the main character that the basically the sergeant uh, the Gene Evans character is in um, as somehow an explanation of his character, and I guess he thought that that may have changed. So I, it was so. I didn't see anything, especially with the, because the big anxiety was communism, okay? Um, and uh, anything that was negative about any of the soldiers in the film would have been seen as potentially feeding, you know, uh, lines to the communists to go see their soldiers are bad. Um, uh, uh, so, I no, I, I saw nothing of substance. And maybe somebody else reading it would see something. Obviously, he thought, he w had done a great job rewriting it, but it was, it's so close. It was nitpicking for sure. And a little bit of a fantasy. Here we it. go. Yes. No, are you talking about, it's called Eight Iron Men? I don't know that film, but he did not do it. Oh, is that the, is that what it's called? Okay, no. He did not. Um, no. Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. So Fuller um, started making films in 1949. He made films really through the 1980s, but very slowly at the end. Um, his, his decade is really the 1950s. Fuller was always a little different than the rest of the filmmakers. I mean, he is quirky, he is super stylized. You might have noticed in that scene with, um, uh, from, from, uh, from the steel helmet that the camera's like circling. I don't know if any of you noticed that unusual camera movement around the, the prisoner of war and the African-American medic. Um, he did a lot of very stylish things in his film that kind of broke with conventions of filmmaking at the time. So while he was successful, he, you know, he did not have the kind of career of someone like John Ford or Alfred Hitchcock, um, Howard Hawks. Um, he made popular films, but erratically. And he had some run-ins. Um, one of the most uh, kind of tragic that really ended his American career was with a film called White Dog, which you may or may not have heard of, which is a film that he made about a racist dog, a dog that was trained to be racist. And it was supposed to be a film about racism and people accused it of being a racist film. So it's like the same strange misunderstanding. And um, he ended up uh, moving to Europe and uh, living as an exile for many years and doing on again, off again 
productions. Um, I think one of the most interesting things I found when I was doing research for this book is he did a television pilot in 1959 um, called Dogface, which is an infantryman's story. Um, he only shot one episode because it wasn't picked up, but um, it's, it was fantastic. And it's about, um, it's about a dog white dog, that made me think of it, um, that's trained, trained by the Nazis. And uh, so this, uh, this command is given out to the Americans to kill the dog, because the dog's a Nazi. And the, dog, the, the soldiers have to figure out if they can actually kill a dog that obviously doesn't know that it's working for the Nazis. So it becomes this moral uh, kind of question. And uh, the dog ends up saving one of the Americans' lives. And so, of course, the dog dies. Sorry, but um, but the point is, is that you know, you know, dogs can't be Nazis. They can be trained to act a certain way. But anyhow, so that was a little bit of a diversion. But no, he did. He did. You know, he Fuller liked darker material, but there's definitely they're not. And even these films, like. There, there are funny moments in every Fuller film. And so his films are interlaced with kind of comedy and relief and then darkness and tragedy. So, um, but not all of them have the seriousness of war. So that was not the only thing he made. Um, uh, like, for example, 40 Guns, Western with Barbara Stanwyck that breaks like every rule of the Western, super fun and irreverent and a little bit over the top, as many Fuller films are. Uh, there was a hand, yes. I, I have two questions. Number one is given the disapproval by the DOD yeah. and the apparent approval by the Department of the Army, yeah. were there possibly more civilian employee reviewers on the DOD side mm -hmm. and possibly more former soldiers on the Department of Army side? That's a great question. Um, and I don't have an answer for that, oh. but I like the theory. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I don't know who that, um, that one Department of Defense reviewer that I think wanted to be a screenwriter. I don't know his background yeah. at all, um, so yeah. I don't have any information on him, but I, I like the theory. Yeah. And you mentioned that the FBI and other agencies got his attention. Did I didn't see any mention of Senator Joe McCarthy. I thought that maybe that was the Department of the Army or the DOD afraid of Joe McCarthy, because he was investigating some high military commanders. Yeah, um, that's also a good question. I will tell you this, Fuller had, there is a um, House on American Activities investigative file on Fuller, although he was never called to testify at those hearings. And it doesn't make any sense, because he should have been, because the way he was being looked at and talked about in the communist press writing about in the conservative press, and the only thing I can come up with is that Daryl Zanuck at Fox, who was like, a, an unquestionable patriot, um, adored Fuller, worked with Fuller, vouched for Fuller, and the only thing I can come up with is that somehow Zanuck intervened and said, this guy is not a communist. Just so he was below. protected by Zanuck, whereas the other this is studios a felt, this is a they, they, they you know, went over and said, well, you can take our screenwriters and we don't care well, too much. You know, what's interesting is that I found um, in the FBI file, there's a memo from someone at Warner Brothers saying, we've just hired this guy Fuller to write a screenplay about a tank, and, um, uh, and uh, we're a little worried about him. Um, what can you tell us about him? And I don't, there's no record of what the FBI responded, but Fuller wrote the story, but not the screenplay for that film. And so I've got to wonder if the response was not what they wanted to hear. And they were just like, we're not touching this. Yes. Yeah. In your research, did you discover how Gene Evans was cast for the movie Steel Helmet? Um, I, I know I've read Fuller tell the story about this, but I can't think of it right now. Do you know it off the, do you know yes, the story? Yes, I do. Tell me the story. He Remind. was an unknown actor at the time yeah. in 1950. And uh, Fuller was doing a casca casting call, and he asked, has anyone here been in the Army? That's and, right. And uh, Gene Evans raised his hand. Yeah. He said, I was a combat engineer. And uh, Fuller uh, threw an M1 rifle at him and said, do the manual of arms. And Gene Evans did it. And Fuller said, you're hired. That's great. Um, thank you for reminding me of that story. I think it's one that Fuller tells in a, in a third face. Um. Just, uh, you're talking about your background being movies. Yeah. Obviously, I'm sure you've seen the documentary uh, Typewriter Rifle Camera. Yes. Uh, with Sean Penn and uh, Timothy Robbins. And they brought up the, what this you were talking about. This is about Fuller, for those of you who yeah, don't know. Yeah, documentary about Fuller and his three phases of his career. But he, they showed the actual notebooks that you were talking about that, that yeah. he took during World War II. Yeah. And 
not just Steel Helmet and uh, but also Big Red One and all these other movies, they were able to show the actual. This is the page. This is the clip. This is and and they, they how he recycled what he experienced in World War II throughout the rest of his career. Yeah, it's amazing. There's a letter he writes to his brother that says something like, I think I have enough material for this war to write stories for six months. And no, it like lasted 50 years. <laughs> um, because those journals and those letters, those things just keep cropping up in different forms over and over again. He found ways to repurpose so much. I mean, that's what really affirms how central this experience was to his career and to his life is that he never let go of those things. And I mean, even something like that, um, that footage of Falkenau concentration camp, for those of you who remember the big red one, what happens towards the end of the film? Liberation of Falkenau concentration camp. Okay, that's one of the last things that happens there. So that's fuller fictionalizing this experience that he had um, uh, in the context of that feature film. Yes, in the back. Oh, I remember I saw, I, 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 when I, I spent time at the Fuller's house as well, and, and um, he, there was a book uh, like of log lines and ideas, which I'm sure you saw. Yeah. There was, uh, it said like war yarns, you know? And there was even something for musical ideas, which was hilarious. I was like, there are gonna be maybe some musicals coming out of some of this. I have no doubt that Fuller would have been able to make a musical war film. I mean, I think his he had so much creative energy. By the way, there are, um, in the Fuller collection, uh, I don't wanna say hundreds, although it could be hundreds, of unproduced scripts, um, some of which are fantastic. I talk about one of them that he did about um, Vietnam. Um, that was never made into a film called The Rifle, which I think it would make a fantastic film. I wish somebody would option it and, and do it. Um, that kind of reworks some of the stuff that uh, you see in uh, The Steel Helmet with the orphan and um, talking about how war uh, you know, challenges human relationships. Uh, and that he always liked that idea of the soldier who was tough and a survivor but really you know, was a feeling, caring person underneath all of that, and that that was always a, a struggle to balance those sides. Any other questions? Thank you all. Oh, yeah, one final, last question. He wrote, so he was a uh, he was uh, writing novels, and um, he had he had a connection uh, through the journalistic world, and um, he had an option. Then he got hired to write a screenplay, and so he were, I mean, he he was a writer. Fuller, no, first and foremost, was a writer. He started off as a journalist, um, and he wrote throughout his entire career. He wrote many of the films that he made, and so um, it was through his experience as a writer and then um, his connections through that world of somebody who had preceded him to Hollywood. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Don't go away. We have prizes for you. <laughs> Not expensive ones. <laughs> so that was, that was terrific, right? Wasn't it, wasn't it fascinating to see how all that sort of comes together uh, and, and begs a thousand other questions? I, I do want to say, I didn't um, uh, announce this at the beginning, but the film that she referred to uh, is a very graphic film about the 1st Infantry Division's, uh, not the liberation of the concentration camp at Falkenau, but uh, as Marcia described it, um, Eisenhower ordered that the neighboring communities of all the concentration camps would be forced to, um, uh, to come in and look at, uh, uh, at the condition of the camps because so many Germans claimed that they, they knew nothing about it. So the first division had to do that at Falkenau. They rounded up the leaders of the local village, they marched the people through the camps, and then they had the leadership prepare many of the corpses for a proper burial. Uh, and Fuller made that film. We've known about it for some time. It's because of Marcia that we found out where it is. Uh, and we now have permission from, the, from Fuller's widow and daughter uh, to use it. And when we reopen on August 26th, we'll conclude uh, our story of the First Division in World War II uh, with that uh, film. Uh, and it, it's, it's very, very, very powerful. And so it's one of the many reasons uh, 
that you need to come back when we reopen on August 26th and see what we've done with the museum. It, it, knock on wood, I, 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 think, I think it's gonna be fabulous. Um, okay, so I have some announcements, but before I do that, we have a couple of things for Marcia. Uh, one is, we want, I wanna give you this uh, copy of a book that we sponsored. Uh, this, is a, this is a military history. Uh, the Dead and Those About to Die, D-Day, The Big Red One at Omaha Beach by John McManus. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy that and it will give you perspective on at least one of the many experiences that Sam Fuller had during his military service. And then the other thing we give to many of the people uh, who, uh, who do great things for us like this talk, uh, and you may have run across this, okay, but there's a military tradition that we have adopted and that's the tradition of the regimental coin. Now, we're not a regiment, but we're a museum, so we have our own little coin, right? And the front is uh, a big red one on an oak leaf. We never claim to be the big red one. We're not the big red one. We're the First Division Museum at Cantini, so the oak leaf, uh, leaf is for Cantini, and then every year we change the back. Depending on what we're observing, this is the 2016 coin, which is a 25th uh, anniversary of Operation Desert Storm, and it has an Abrams tank because, of course, the First Division played a very prominent role in Desert Storm. And we always, you always turn those over with a handshake like yeah. that, right? Okay, so when I see you again, if I have mine and you don't have yours, you buy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Are you buying tonight? <laughs> I already bought. <laughs> you ordered water. <laughs> anyway, let's give her one more <laughs> round of applause. You're welcome. Okay, so.